In this video lecture, we're going to talk about some of the high-level Java concurrency mechanisms. Good place to find information about this lecture is in the CS65 lecture notes, and specifically, if you go to the Java concurrency lecture, and then you go to the uh, section that talks about high-level concurrency objects. Thus far in the course, what we've been talking about is low-level Java concurrency mechanisms, spawning individual threads, also using synchronization methods, synchronization statements, the weight object to lock objects, and these mechanisms are fine for relatively small-scale concurrency or for something like a chat room. They do not scale as well to high levels of concurrency, nor do they necessarily use well a multi-core architecture. So as of Java version 1.5, Java introduced a series of new high-level Java concurrency mechanisms to help with this. The first thing is explicit mutex locks rather than the uh, implicit uh, locks that go with synchronized methods or the object locks that go with synchronized statements. The mutex locks are going to handle deadlock, which is something we introduced in a previous video lecture, but have not yet been able to solve. Second thing they introduced was so-called executor objects, which create thread pools. Thread pools are pools of worker threads that are able to execute tasks. Tasks are exactly what the runnables and threads have been thus far. You create typically a runnable object or a thread object, and then you give it to a thread pool. It's placed on a queue of executable tasks. When a thread becomes available, the thread or worker thread executes that task. We'll talk about how that can improve the operation of the virtual machine when we get to executors. We've already talked about atomic variables, which give us the ability to have atomic operations for things like increment and get. Also with the high-level Java concurrency mechanisms are a few new synchronized uh, collection classes, especially hash maps and sorted maps. And finally, they have uh, improved and more efficient random number generation when you have multiple threads needing to generate random numbers. These new features can all be found in the java.util.concurrent library, so you'll need to import that. We'll start by talking about mutex locks, and they implement an interface called the lock interface, which provides uh, four principal methods. The first is the lock method, which allows you to acquire a lock and sleep if necessary. This is a equivalent to a synchronized statement or a synchronized method. You will sleep as long as necessary in order to get the lock. What makes this a better locking mechanism is the try lock uh, command, because that allows you to try to acquire a lock and to back out after a certain number of milliseconds. This avoids deadlock in the situation where someone else also has a lock that you're trying to get and you don't want the two of you mutually holding locks that the other one wants. So try lock returns true when its success faults on failure and um, unlock will allow us to release the lock when we're done with it. Lock interruptibility is like lock, but it will allow the thread to be interrupted while waiting by throwing the interrupted exception. Whereas lock, even if we get an interrupt command, we will not um, uh, break. We will wait for the lock, and we would have to test the interrupted uh, method in order to know whether we uh, had been interrupted or not. The most common class for implementing the lock interface is the reentrant lock class. It allows us to, or it allows a acquiring thread to reacquire the lock in another uh, method. So if you're trying to, if you acquire the lock, you call another method, that method also tries to acquire the lock. As long as you're the thread holding the lock 
you will be granted access to the lock. That's why it's called a re-entrant lock, because in effect, if we try to get it recursively, we can. The entrant lock class has a constructor that, as an optional parameter, takes a fairness parameter. By default, it's false. But when you set it to true, it means that the longest waiting thread will get access to the lock, and that will prevent starvation. The downside is that it will add to the overhead and will cause threads to run a bit longer, but it is fair and allows all programs to make progress toward terminating. To illustrate our new locks, let's revisit our friends Gaston and Alphonse, who you'll remember from a vi previous video lecture, could get into a deadlock bowing to one another. And we actually, while we illustrated the problem, we never showed you how to solve the problem. To quickly refresh your memory, let's just take a look at the basics of the problem. We create two friends, Alphonse and Gaston, and then we create two threads, one for Alphonse bowing to Gaston and one for Gaston bowing to Alphonse. So let's just take a look at the Alphonse Gaston one right here. You can see that bow loop, we have Alphonse is going to be the bower and Gaston is going to be the bowee. So what we're assuming is that Alphonse initiated this little ritual by bowing to Gaston and now Gaston has to bow back to Alphonse. You can see here we get into, we just run an infinite loop and we sleep for only uh, between 1 and 10 milliseconds and then when we wake up we have Gaston try to bow back to Alphonse. And you'll remember that if these two loops running too close together that they're going to conflict. Each of them will acquire one of the two locks and they won't be able to complete their little ritual. They'll be permanently um, permanently in deadlock. So here's our new way of avoiding deadlock. We have a class safe lock and in the friend class, which is a nested subclass, we create a re-entrant lock for each friend. And in order to do the bowing, we're going to have to acquire both locks before we're allowed to start the bow. So when I try to, when Gaston tries to bow back to Alphonse, so right here we have that this is Gaston, he is the bowee, and the bower is Alphonse. So we want to bow back to Alphonse. Before we do that, we want to make sure that we're able to get both of the locks. So we're going to call a new method called impending bow to see whether we can get both of those locks. Okay, so we come up here and again our friend is Alphonse that we is the bower who has bowed to us. So my lock is Gaston's lock and your lock is the friend's lock which is Alphonse's lock. You can see from the try statement that what we're trying to do is get a hold of both of the locks and we use a try lock and it will immediately exit if we can't get the lock with a return value of false. If it succeeds it returns with a value of true. And in both cases, we, that's why we have the finally, no matter what happens we are going to check to make sure that we got both locks. If we did not get both locks, then we're going to check whether we got either lock, and if we did, we're going to unlock it, thus preventing the deadlock situation. And finally, we return the AND of the two return values. So if we got both locks, it will return true, otherwise it will return false. Back here in BOW, you can see that if we are able to get both locks, then we're going to initiate the bow process. And we do that by 
calling Alphonse's bow back method. And Alphonse's bow back method is simply an acknowledgement that we bowed to him. So once he has acknowledged that we bowed to him, then we can complete the bowing process by unlocking both locks and getting out. Down here, you can see the bow back procedure. So now we had called it Alphonse's bow back procedure with Gaston. And you can see that what happens is we're simply, Alphonse is acknowledging that Gaston has bowed back to me. You can see that once Alphonse's bow back method has acknowledged that we bow to them, we unlock our locks and get out. If, on the other hand, we can't obtain one of the two locks or we can't obtain either lock, you can see that we say that Alphonse started to bow to me but saw that I was already bowing to him and therefore we backed out. So if I wasn't able to get the locks, we're presuming that Alphonse, uh, that I actually had already started the bowing process and had locked everything up. The ultimate effect of our new bow procedure is that if we are unable to obtain both locks, we do not initiate the bowing process. And notice we don't try to go into a loop here. We simply exit and return from the bow. We just don't attempt it. And what happens is back here, we return from trying to do the bow, we simply go back, sleep for another 10 seconds, and then we again assume that Alphonse has bowed to us and that we have to bow back. Meanwhile, Alphonse is doing the same thing every uh, between one and 10 milliseconds. He's waking up and assuming that we have, or that Gaston has bowed to him and that he needs to bow back. The next item we're going to consider is Java's task and thread pools. In Java, a task is a computation that you want repeated one or more times, and it's embedded in a thread or a runnable, either one. A task is typically placed in the run procedure, although we're going to see that some tasks are able to return values, in which case you implement a different method called a uh, call method and later on we're even going to have some kinds of recursive tasks that implement other methods but for right now just assume a task simple task computation you want repeat it one or more times you embed it in either a thread object or you put it in a runnable and then what you're going to do is pass it off to a thread pool. And a thread pool is a pool of one or more worker threads to which tasks may be assigned. So when we submit a task to a thread pool, it's placed on the queue, it's ultimately executed by one of the worker threads when they become available. Now one issue with these thread pools is that the threads aren't preemptible. If a thread sleeps for two milliseconds, it hogs the uh, thread, that worker thread. It does not release the worker thread. So you have to manage these thread pools carefully in case you think that you're going to be able to get a lot of concurrency between threads like we did with the chat room. That's actually not true. If you have more threads than worker threads, some of those threads are going to just be sitting there until the other tasks have completed. So if we had a chat room, for example, and let's say we wanted to have M members and we had only N worker threads and N was less than M, in fact, we would only be able to accommodate N people in the chat room at any one time. The remaining M minus N clients would be sitting in threads just stalled because they weren't assigned to a worker thread. So be cognizant of the fact that Worker threads cannot uh, release a thread when that thread goes to sleep. It stays there until the thread finishes execution. There are three kinds of so-called executors that are provided to manage the thread pools, and each of them is an interface. 
Executor, Executor Service, and Scheduled Executor Service are the three such interfaces. Executor is the simplest interface. It simply supports launching new tasks. Executor, executor Service is a sub-interface and it adds features that allow you to manage the life cycle uh, both of the individual tasks and of the thread pool. So with the individual tasks, you're able to have them return values, you're able to interrupt them. With the uh, thread pool, you're able to shut it down. You can't do that with the executor. The thread simply supposed to, or the task is supposed to run to completion with the executor. But with the executor service, you get the ability to interrupt your tasks. And then finally, with the scheduled executor service, that allows you to implement future tasks. So say I put a task on, but I don't want it to run until midnight. You can support that or periodic execution of tasks. Let's say I have a clock and I want it to run every 10 milliseconds. I would use a scheduled executor service because it would execute the task repetitively every 10 milliseconds. Let's first talk about the executor class. Um, which implements or provides a collection of factory methods and it creates the thread pools that get managed by one of the three executor interfaces. And we will show you an example of the factory methods in a moment. For the time being, just know that there's a variety of factory methods that allow you to allocate fixed size thread pools that allow you to allocate adjustable size thread pools that allow the virtual machine to take advantage of the number of multi-cores that it's running on. That makes your code more portable. Uh, you can create so-called fork join thread pools that allow you to do massive concurrency. Uh, we'll talk about some of these different kinds of pools. Others we will let you investigate more thoroughly. One thing about these executor services, it's pretty detailed. We could spend probably a week or more going over this topic alone. So part of this is just a survey of them to let you know uh, how this uh, uh, thread pool mechanism works. Let's start now with the executor interface. And it essentially just allows you to submit runnable tasks to a thread pool via the execute method. To give you an idea of what the executor uh, service does, I've created a class called thread pool tester. And within that, I've created a nested class called print message, which is a task. And all it's going to do is print a random number between 4 and 77, which you see right here, and it's going to do it three times. And then it's going to sleep for 2,000 milliseconds between printing the random numbers. And you can see here that's all the run method does, or all this task does. Executes three times, prints a random number between 4 and 77, sleeps for two uh, seconds, and returns. And you can see that we implemented our task as a thread. We could have also implemented it as a runnable and that we put it into the run method. We now, in our constructor for thread pool tester, create a fixed thread pool with three elements using one of the factory classes from the executor class. So we create a fixed thread pool of three elements assigning it, and that returns a interface which is actually a compatible with executor, executor service, and a scheduled executor service. Um, right here we're using the simplest one because that's the one we just talked about which is an executor. And you can see that what we do is we're actually creating six tasks, although we only have three threads. And we are executing them using the execute command. So each we create each an instance of each thread or each task, then call execute, and that's added to the pool's queue. And it will execute as many as it can at a time, which is going to be three of them. So let's 
watch this now in action. So you can see the first three threads get the worker threads and they're not relinquishing their worker thread and then the last three get them. Again, what's important to notice is that the first three threads got their worker threads and then even though they slept for two seconds, they did not relinquish them. So only when the first three threads finished did threads three, four, and five get an opportunity to continue. You also see the program did not return here. It's still sitting there waiting for more tasks and that's because the executor, the simple executor interface, doesn't give us a way of managing the thread pool or shutting it down. So typically we need something Typically, we need something that's going to allow us to manage the thread pool, such as shutting it down. So therefore, the executor service interface is a much more commonly used one. And it provides a number of added features over the executor interface. In fact, it is a sub-interface of the executor interface. So it supports everything the executor interface supports, plus a few additional features. The first is it allows us to submit either runnable or callable tasks. A callable task can return a value, and it does it by returning a so-called future object, which you can then uh, use to access the value returned by the task. And the future object also gives you the ability to manage a task by interrupting it, for example, and causing it to shut down. We also can use the executor service to shut down a thread pool. So the shutdown command says that we're accepting no new tasks, but we will finish executing all the running and waiting tasks. So they will get a chance to finish. Shutdown now, by contrast, not only accepts no new tasks, it tries to kill the waiting tasks. Well, it actually kills the waiting tasks. And then it tries to kill the running tasks by calling interrupt. So waiting tasks that have not yet gotten a thread immediately killed. Running tasks, it calls their interrupt methods, although it's up to each task as to whether or not they actually die. And only when they actually die will the thread pool shut down. So here's our thread pool tester again, but we've made two modifications to it. First of all, we've now said that we are going to be using an executor service rather than an executor. Remember that the factory methods for the executors class returns a interface that's compatible with both executor and executor service. The second thing we've done is added a shutdown method at the end of our um, constructor. Remember, the shutdown method is not going to immediately shut down the thread pool. It's going to allow the six existing tasks to finish executing, and then it will shut down the thread pool. And because that will finish our constructor, and because main simply called the constructor, our program will exit this time. So let's compile that and run it. You can see again the first three threads getting the worker threads. Now the next three threads get the worker thread. And now they finish and you can see that the program actually returned this time. The second program we're going to look at is showing you how you can get tasks to return values via callable objects. So now I'm having print message implement the callable interface and it's going to be returning an integer, specifically the last random number that it generates. And you can see that now the method is that we implement is call rather than run. And we're having it return an integer, a uh, wrapper class, because we have to use objects with these interfaces. We can't, they're generics, therefore we have to use wrapper objects. And we're still going ahead and generating a random number between 477. We're printing it out and sleeping for 2,000 seconds. But now when we finish, we simply return the last random number. And remember that Java does automatic boxing. So even though we declared random number as an int,
Java will automatically box that up into an integer object and return it to our program. Now down here, we want to be able to look at the values of those return objects. So I am, as I submit each task, and I'm now using a submit command rather than execute. So I use execute when I have a task that doesn't return a value, and I use submit when I have a task that's going to return a value. And specifically, submit takes a callable object because that's the type that returns a value. So this returns a future, and in this case, it's a future that is a integer, and we add that future to a array list that we're maintaining. So up here, I declared an array list of future integer objects, and I'm just maintaining this uh, list of objects so that I can print out their future values. So after I've launched them and I've added them to the thread list, down here I'm iterating through my array list and you can see that I am calling. You can see that I am for each um, entry or each future, I'm getting it and then I'm getting its value using get. And the get will block waiting for the task to finish. So it will not return a value until I actually get a value out of the future. And then once I have that value, I can proceed to the next task and ask for its value. So let's run this. Again, you can see the threads are running. And you can see that when they returned, right here, threads 0, 1, and 2, returned 7, 24, and 17. And then when the last three threads returned, they also printed out their values. So up here, here's thread 0. It printed as soon as it finished. And then notice that thread 4 actually got into its task. And thread 3 actually got into its task. And then even though thread 1 and 2 had finished, they had to wait a little on their futures before we got them. Then the futures, we were able to get them, and we printed them out here. Now the remaining threads ran, and when they finished, they printed out their values using the futures. So that's how the futures interface works in Java. The final service is the scheduled executor service, which allows us to schedule repeating tasks. And it gives us two options, either a fixed rate task or a fixed delay task. So the fixed rate task executes every n time unit. So for example, if I say every uh, 1,000 milliseconds, then it will execute at 1,000 milliseconds, 2,000 milliseconds, 3,000 milliseconds or as near to there as possible. That means that in, it doesn't guarantee that it will execute at 1,000 milliseconds. It could actually execute at, say, 1,500 milliseconds. But what's guaranteed is that the next one will then be scheduled at 2,000, and it might execute at, say, 2,001, and then this would still be guaranteed to execute at 3,000. So they're scheduled every n time units. In contrast with fixed delay, the next task is not scheduled until the current one completes. So let's say that the first one, again, started at time 1,000, well, came available at time 1,000, but did not execute until time 1,500. That would mean that the next version of the task, let's say it finished at, 20, at 1,501, would not be scheduled until 2,501. And let's say that that task finished at, um, say, or started at, say, 2550 and finished at 2551, then the next task would be scheduled at 3551. So it's always end time units after the termination of the current task which could cause the clock to drift. But on the other hand, if we're doing something like a simulation, 
that's what we desire. We may not want the next action to start until n time units after the current uh, one has finished. So fixed rate might be good for a clock. Fixed delay might be good for a simulation. And then we can cancel a repeating task by calling cancel on its returned future object. And this also, as I said earlier, allows you to schedule a one-shot task at a future time. For example, if we wanted to do some kind of file cleanup at midnight when no one's likely to be on the system. So as an example, we're going to work through a beep program that beeps every 10 seconds for one hour. Here you see the code for our beep program. And you can see that we are creating, first of all, a thread pool with a single task. And it is called a scheduled thread pool. So that's going to return a scheduled executor service. Next, in our constructor, we're creating a runnable object. And all that runnable object does is beep. Notice there's no sleeping on it. This is going to allow us to relinquish the processor, the thread. Remember, the, pre the problem with the previous thread services was that we could not relinquish the worker thread. If we slept, we hogged the worker thread. With a scheduled service, we're able to relinquish the thread, the worker thread, so that some other thread can come in and use it. So that's an advantage of the scheduled executor service is that we can have other threads coming in and using it. Now, there's still this only works with scheduling. It's still not going to work well for our chat program because the chat program wanted to block waiting for user input. And you don't know how often that's going to come in. You could try to schedule something that listens in every, say, 100 milliseconds. So that might be a way to implement a chat room. But you have to work within the parameters of we're scheduling and running every so often. You can't do it on the parameters of, oh, I'm going to block waiting for some I.O. stream. That's not going to allow us to release the worker thread. Only when we finish our task do we relinquish the worker thread. OK, so all we're doing here is beeping. And you see no sleeping, because that's going to be handled by the scheduling mechanism. The next thing that we do is that we actually schedule our beeper. So we give it to the scheduler and say to schedule it at a fixed rate. And we're saying that there's an initial delay of 10 seconds. And then every 10 seconds thereafter, we want it to go. And notice we scheduled it at a fixed rate so that even if there's a little delay, it will still start up at 20, 30, 40, etc. And we're allowed to specify the time unit, which in this case is seconds. And we get back from that a scheduled future. And notice we use the wildcard character here. Remember that this is an unbounded wildcard that says we can get back any kind of object whatsoever. So effectively, it's saying that we can deal with a um, object, the top level of the uh, Java hierarchy. So we don't care what kind of thing it potentially is returning. It can be anything, and hence we use an unbounded wildcard here. We now do a one-shot scheduling on that future. And specifically, what we want to do is in an hour, which is 3,600 seconds from now, we want to run uh, this runnable. And it's simply going to call the cancel method on beeper handle so that finally we will stop the running of beeper and it will terminate after one hour. So again, a quick review, because this is a little bit nuanced. We are, first of all, creating a runnable object that simply beeps. And there's no time associated with it. The second thing we do is we schedule that object to run every 10 seconds indefinitely. There's no time limit on it. But we do get back a scheduled future from that. We then 
use that scheduled future, that are handled to that scheduled future, to create a one-shot in the future, one hour from now, to create a runnable that will run and simply call the cancel method on this future in one hour so that we shut down the beeper after one hour. The next item we want to talk about is fork join pools, which is something else that is provided for us by the executor service. And fork join pools are good for when we want to get a lot of parallelism in our task. And it's designed for work that can be recursively divided into smaller tasks. So here's the basic pseudocode right here that we want to use. So we first of all say if my portion of the work is small enough, do the work directly, else split my work into two pieces, invoke the two pieces, which means we're going to hand the two um, pieces, which will be subtasked, back into the fork join pool, and then wait for the results, and then do any processing we need to combine the results. So hopefully uh, you think of something like sort here. For example, quick sort, you might say, if my portion of the work is small enough, so if the array is small enough, I simply maybe use selection sort to sort it, else I split or partition my array into two pieces, then invoke um, create two subtasks that will sort the um, two partitions and then wait for the results. So this is the general form of the task, although it doesn't have to be that you split it into two pieces, it could be into n pieces, and then we could invoke it on the n pieces. So again, the way we use our fork join pools is that we first are going to wrap our code that we want to parallelize into something called a fork join task subclass. And there's typically two subclasses we use, either recursive task, which returns a value, or a recursive action, which does not return a value. For example, with quicksort, which simply sorts an array in place, we are not going to return a value. Same thing with merge sort, whereas let's say our recursive task was to sum an array of numbers, then we would want to return a value and we'd use a recursive task. It is these recursive, uh, these fork join task subclasses that we're then submitting for execution using the fork join task invoke all method. And it takes an arbitrary length comma separated list of fork join task objects as a parameter. That's why I said you could invoke n subtasks. You simply give those n objects as a comma separated list to the invoke all method and it will invoke all of them. And then it will return when is done is true for each task. So once all the tasks have finished, it returns. And there's some things about what happens if there's exceptions in the task. You can read the documentation. We're not going to go into details about it. So in, once we have coded up the fork join task, we then create a fork join pool instance to initiate the recursive task and we do that by calling the invoke method with the top level fork join task object which again will be either a recursive action or a recursive task. So as an example we're going to show you two things. First an increment task where we're incrementing each object in an array and then a sort um, task where we're doing a sort. So here's our first item, which is the increment task. We're just incrementing each item or each element in an array. So the idea is we have an array. Okay, we might have 3, 6, 8, 10, 11. And at the end, each of them is going to be incremented by 1. So we're going to be doing something where we keep breaking the array in 2 and assigning the two subtasks to different uh, threads until we get to a, a certain threshold where we consider the array small enough to just sweep through it and do the increment. So here is our class. We're extending recursive action. 
and we're given an array with its low and high indices that we are adding one to and you can see that the um, method we override is compute so compute is the method that's going to be doing something and it is a protected method not a public method so that's something to keep in mind and this is the part that if the we can do the work ourselves if the size of what we're summing is less than some threshold we simply sweep through the array and do the increment if it's not then we calculate the midpoint by using a shift and then we call invoke all and you'll see that we're creating two subtasks you can see that they're both instances of increment task one with the lower half of the array and one with the upper half of the array and we would simply wait until invoke all returned when it did since we're at the top level it would simply exit compute and we are done with our task here's our second example where we're sorting and again it's a recursive action and in this case again we have the compute method and when our array is that we're sorting is below a certain level we simply sequentially sort it and this would be a method we would have to implement in this class in the recursive action class so sequentially sort would be a method we're not showing it but would be a method in the recursive action class that we would implement otherwise again we split the task into two and call invoke all with two subsort tasks but now you can see that we do some post-processing after the tasks have completed in this case calling merge with our array and using low and high as our two indices so in this case what we got back was two sorted half arrays this array was half sorted and this array the upper half is sorted but now we have to merge the two parts and we're doing that using this merge routine which again we would have to write and put into this recursive action class now in order to run the sort task here's the final actions we create the top level task saying we want to sort the array starting from index 0 up to the length of the array minus 1 then we create a fork join pool and then we simply call invoke passing the sorter task as our top level task now the fork join pool by default will create a number of threads equal to the number of processors on our machine that's why it can take advantage of a multi-core architecture and it also employs what's called work stealing so this top level task is going to spawn two subtasks which in turn will spawn two potentially two subtasks and the thread that's running this top level task won't necessarily execute the two subtasks most likely what will happen is it will execute one of the two subtasks and then another of the worker threads will quote steal the second task because there's no reason for the um, if we have idle threads for this second task to sit waiting for the initial thread to finish with the first subtask it'd be better if it were um, handled by another uh, worker thread so basically when a worker thread spawns two subtasks it won't necessarily execute those two subtasks it may execute one of them but another of the tasks may be executed by some other thread if it's idle so that's called work stealing because if a thread becomes idle it looks around for other tasks that it might be able to uh, handle and that's why we get the high level of parallelism with the fork join let's move on now to concurrent collections we've already seen atomic variables and how they have atomic operations like increment and get concurrent collections are meant to do the same thing they're meant to have atomic operations like inserting 
a element into the collection, removing an element from a collection, or getting a value, it makes these operations atomic so that no other uh, thread can access that collection object while the current operation is in progress, or at least it makes sure there can't be any contention. So most of the collection classes are not synchronized. They will do what's called fail fast if a concurrent modification is attempted. The problem is that they do so only on what's called a best effort basis. So if you have, say, an array list, which is not a synchronized collection object, and you try to do two modifications on it simultaneously, the Java Virtual Machine will make a best effort to fail fast if there's um, these threads contend, but it doesn't guarantee that it will be able to, and that's what makes using non-synchronized collection classes very dangerous with threads unless you do your own synchronization by dropping these uh, collection objects like an array list into a class that has synchronized methods or synchronized statements. Then when you do your own synchronization on them uh, by protecting them using synchronized methods or synchronized statements, that's okay. But in general, if you just do gets and puts on collection objects, you can't assume that they're going to um, work properly with threads unless they're a synchronized class. And essentially, there are four uh, synchronized collection objects. So there's the blocking queue, which is a FIFO class that blocks when either it's empty or it's full, meaning if someone tries to, a consumer tries to pull a element out and it's empty, the consumer will block. If a producer tries to add an element to the queue and it's full, it will block. So obviously blocking queues are good for producer-consumer problems. There's a concurrent map class, which is good for hash tables, and a concurrent navigable map object that's good for sorted maps. Finally, the vector class is good, is a synchronized, uh, um, in effect, array class, whereas an array list is an unsynchronized array class. It is always better if you're using a single thread to use unsynchronized classes because synchronized classes introduce overhead. Some of that overhead is every time you enter a synchronized method, it has to obtain the lock. Then, remember, it has to flush all registers to memory and then has to read from memory. And finally, when it finishes, it has to flush all registers to memory and has to unlock the object. The biggest problem with the flush of the registers is it kills pipelining. So if your um, most current uh, processors use highly sophisticated pipelining algorithms, but if you're flushing stuff to memory, it kills the pipelining algorithms and your performance suffers. That's why it's bad to use a vector in a sequential or in a program that's only using a single thread that's not parallel. It's much better to use an array list because the vector is going to slow things down. Finally, there is random numbers, and there's a class called thread local random, which is, if you use it, it isolates the random number generator to the current thread. Now, you have seen us use instances of the random number generator and create a unique instance for each thread. That's fine. It's just not as fast as using the thread local random. It's specifically optimized for concurrent uh, threads. It is internally seeded, so you cannot set the seed. That's one disadvantage. It makes the uh, behavior not reproducible. But it does avoid sharing or contention with using math.random, which is a synchronized random number generator that can be used by concurrent threads, but if you have a lot of threads generating random numbers, that could cause a lot of contention with the math random number generator. So the 
thread local random allows us to um, basically isolate a unique instance of a random number generator in each thread. And the usage is you call, it's a static method current that you call from thread local random that returns the instance of the local random number generator for this thread. Then you call next x, where you place x with int or long or double, whatever you want. And you can also get bounded ranges, like down here I'm asking for an integer between 4 and 73. And while I had not dwelled on it extensively, in our example, I was using thread local random to generate the random numbers when I was illustrating my thread pools and my callable thread pools. This completes our lecture on the high-level Java concurrency mechanisms. Just as a quick recap, it adds mutex locks, which allows us to avoid deadlock, executors, which allow us to have thread pools, and we can create tasks that execute on the thread pools. And the big advantage of thread pools is it allows the virtual machine to optimize parallelism based on the number of multi-cores available. Atomic variables for uh, low-level concurrency with variables, concurrent collections for higher-level concurrency. What I mean by higher-level is atomic variables are a single variable, collections are a higher-level object, but concurrent collections give us atomic operations on certain things like maps, sorted maps, vectors, and blocking queues. And then random number generation, we can isolate a random number generator in each thread making it faster than ha going through the general math.random number generator.